This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel <laughs> is the reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. Yep, I was a little bit late. Hold on, I gotta do the, uh, get the chat over there. Somebody was trying to get get rid of the dog that looked like we, and I had to check it out. Yes, everybody. Yeah, I thought that was a, a cool conversation that we had. Uh, both my dogs just got a uh, bath, so they're running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Although I have to admit, I've never seen a chicken running around with its head cut off. Oh, I have, Gray. It was really neat. I, I don't care. But uh, what I was just saying was that uh, I've never seen one, but I'm kind of imagining just kind of running all over the place with no direction. Yeah, but the, the conversation we had was regarding the, um, you know, my, I made a comment yesterday. I said, you know, when you're shy, it's just sort of being selfish, you know. It's not, I, I don't think people that are shy are selfish people. What I'm saying is, is the act of being shy is sort of selfish. But in the conversation that we had today, you know, you can see that there's a whole bunch of different circumstances, you know, like of why somebody might be that way. But I don't think what I said was, quote, disgusting. I mean, that's such an overblown term, you know. People are just so um, sensitive and triggered these days. It's really sad. It's scary, actually. You'd think people would have a little bit more ability just to kind of go, I kind of see what he's saying. You know, I don't know if I worded it quite right, you know, like... Uh, you know, for me, it means when you're when you're shy, you're kind of somebody who is, um, you know, you're sort of inwardly looking at yourself, and you're scared to say something or nervous to say something because you're wondering how somebody else is going to feel when you say something, right? Yeah, that that's why people, some someone might be shy. It's not the same as introverted or anything like that. So, I don't know. I, I used to be the same way. I guess I, you know, every once in a while I'm still a little bit like that. But, you know, it's mainly because you're just kind of like, wow, you know, you're in a totally different environment or something like that. But, you know, like I said in the conversation, I had a teacher that, you know, I used to have to wear a mouthpiece for my teeth. And she'd like mock and imitate me because I, I had a hard time swallowing with it and she'd imitate me in front of the class and make fun of me and stuff you know so it made me a little bit uh, you know reluctant to say anything try to hide basically yeah she was an idiot you know of course you know with all the teachers unions out there a teacher like that can't get fired they just need training you know so that was, uh, you know, I, I, but what I'm saying is when somebody told me, you're kind of, you're sort of being selfish. You're thinking about yourself. I then went, let me, let me see, let me think. And that kind of, you know, sort of made sense, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, for example, if you're in a group of, or in a room full of people and there's all these people that are, they're chatting away, but you're shy sitting over there. Why don't you just go over and talk, go up and say something to them? You know, forget how you're feeling. Just go up and say, 
hey, so what, uh, you know, like focus in on them and all of a sudden they're interested in you too, right? I know it's hard to do that first thing, but it is sort of the reality of it, right? I don't know. I think some bullies are just, they think it's cool. It makes them feel good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there, there's always a reason for everything, right? But I'm not going to, there's no good reason. All bull, Some bullies aren't bullies because they were treated shitty at home or by anybody else. They're just bullies because they like it. They like being having the power and making somebody feel shitty. Yeah, but of course, there's probably some that are... They were bullied, so they're going to bully somebody else. It's just like, you know, the killers. Serial killers. A lot of them get raised in decent homes. You know, there's nothing going wrong or anything. They just are that way. You know, and then there's some that are, through their environment, become that way. Right? <laughs> yeah, but I had this idiot newbie uh, YouTuber that was commenting on my video like, Hey, uh, you know, I was excited to watch a new video, but man, your comment on, uh, you know, people that are shy or, or selfish was disgusting and I'm never going to watch again. Just think what a loser you are to have a response like that to something so simple. It's just a conversation. You know, total, total, total loser, that person, okay? And literally, like, that's what they are. There isn't, like, it's not a debate. It's not like, well, maybe they just, no, no. It's a technical fact. Um. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if, if you were somebody that felt bad, I wasn't saying that you're a, a selfish person. I'm saying maybe the act of being shy has some selfish quality. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, adjust it. There's some selfishness to it because you're focusing on yourself. All right? I think that's kind of obvious. So... Um, you know, I, don't, I, I wasn't saying that you're rude, or, or I mean, um, selfish, a selfish person, if you're shy, okay? It's like if somebody punches somebody in the face, you know, I would say, God, that was really mean, but maybe they were a good person right before that. <laughs> well, that's not a great analogy. Pretty shitty one, actually, but, uh, you know, because punching somebody in the face... Um, I don't know. <laughs> I can't come up with a really good one right this second. It's probably more like, um, you know, if somebody yelled at somebody, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. It means that they lost their temper during that time. All right. Nah, it's not... That's not it. I love you, but. Yeah. I'm not even sure what that even means. Hello, Jamie McLaughlin. Oh, thanks, Emily Flotilla and Zozo and Zozo again. Up, up, up. Yeah, you guys should go read the conversation if you're a channel member. If you're not a channel member, well, you're just missing out. Stacy had a good post in there. A lot of people like good posts. Yeah. Oh, well, Blazers won tonight. Thank, thank God. There's a little bit of an update in the Erica Lloyd case. 
Apparently they found another body out there. Somebody was saying, no, it's the same, no, it's not the same body, even though it's right in the same place. All right, so you remember, this is where James lived here, and then they found this body by a motorcycle rider, and there was even a picture of it, like a skull, and that was in this area, apparently. But then they said they found another body at this intersection. You know, somewhere near this intersection here. Okay, but they found it. I mean, if you look at the article, uh, unless it's absolutely horribly written, which definitely is possible. It says, we have limited information about a body that was found in the desert in Wonder Valley. Um, oh, that's a different one. See, that's crazy. Okay, that's wild. Hold on a second. So that was the July 24th one. That's why it sounded so similar. Hold on just a second. Yeah, look, look at this. Look at it. These are two different stories. So this is the one from July 24th, it looks like. We have limited information about a body that was found in the desert in Wonder Valley. Hey, thanks, Maureen. At 12.15, a man riding an off-road motorcycle reported that he discovered a skeletal remains about a quarter mile south of Amboy Road and Wilson Road. Okay, so this is Amboy Road, and there's Wilson Road right there. So that was the body. I have that one pinned that was found on July 25th. I think that's what this stands for right there. It makes sense. And then early Thursday morning, sheriff investigators collected the skeletal remains, and the homicide team is conducting a death investigation. The coroner is attempting to make an identification. It's unknown how long the remains have been in the area. Okay, so there's that story. And then this one. Look how similar it sounds, but it, this was from today. The Lancaster County Sheriff's Office is asking for assistance from the public. Oh, that's a different, excuse me, I got it. <laughs> it's a different article. That, this is one I was going to look at too, but it is from today. Though. Hold on a second. Uh, this one, is it this one? Yeah, here it is. The San Bernardino County Coroner is investigating a case of human remains found in Wonder Valley this weekend, and that's February 2nd, 2021. I mean, it almost sounds like the same article, right? It's wild. Thanks, Swerbs. The San Bernardino County Coroner is investigating a case of human remains found in Wonder Valley this weekend, same Wonder Valley, at about 9.30 in the morning. Remember, this one was 12.15. I didn't say a.m. or not, but I'm pretty sure it's p.m. Sunday, a resident found human remains near Dandy Road and Amboy Road. Detectives from the Homicide Division and Coroner's Office responded. There was no identification with the remains. News will have more information when it becomes available. All right, so that's right here. Look, look at that. Here is Amboy and Danby Road. So they found another body right here literally just five or six months after the other body was found right here and then again James his body was found up here so three bodies have been found in this area that's pretty crazy just that alone right yeah but here here's what I think I think it's possible that this body right here is Erica Lloyd this other, this new one that they found. And here's what I think, because we, we remember way back when we were looking at this, Erica Lloyd on the 16th of June drove through this town and was spotted on a school camera right here, uh, at this school right here, it picked her up driving north. And at the time I said, well, she probably drove north and then turned right on Amboy and then drove this direction 
and then on Sheldon Road, she turned right, and this is where her car was found, right here. So maybe she got in an accident, and she was stuck there, and she didn't know what to do, so she started, I'm just going to throw this out there. And so she walked back exactly the way she came, up Shelton, left on Amboy, and then maybe she died similarly to the way that James died. Maybe it was heat exposure or you know, maybe somebody killed her. I mean, it just seems really bizarre that you can have all these deaths in this area. And then I remember her uh, phone pinged way down there somewhere. I think it was like way down here. So I don't know how her phone got here. Maybe somebody just found her phone on the road up where her body was found and just picked it up and took it. Yeah, there's another person named Echo Lloyd. This is Erica Lloyd. We weren't talking about Echo Lloyd. What does that have to do with anything? Thirteen year anniversary for who? Erica Lloyd didn't die thirteen years ago. Oh God. How about this? Hey, hey, the Shady Willow, send me an email, okay? You're disrupting the show, okay? Thank you. All right, so I think it's possible that they walked this direction like the she walked this way and then was heading back because that's the only way she knew how to get back to town. I think that's possible, though, right? Yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah. So that's the update on that. And then the other case is apparently this woman has been found, but at the time it said the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office is asking for assistance from the public in locating Dana uh, Benitez from rural Raymond, Nebraska. Dana Benitez was reportedly last seen in the area of Highway 34 and Northwest 42nd. I think it says Nebraska. I don't know. Uh, let, let me go there really quick. Hold on. Now it's such a tiny little community. And they said Highway 34 and Northwest 42nd. Mm, I don't know. So it's probably in this town right here. Oh, there it was. Thirty four. And what was the other one? Forty second. Hmm. Lincoln. I just saw Highway 34 a minute ago. Right there, 34, coming down. So, might even be it's near another case that we discussed. So, somewhere around. 
I don't know. I, I don't even feel comfortable saying it's that because Raymond's up here. I mean, apparently, maybe she was down there. But anyways, let's just go through it. At this time, she was a passenger in a pickup that slid off the road and got stuck in a ditch. The driver went to get help and reports when he returned, Dana was gone. For the driver, Dana did not have a coat or other winter clothes with her. Dana Benitez is described as 28 years old, white female, brown hair, green eyes. She's 5 foot 11 and 200 pounds. She doesn't look like she's 200 pounds, just her face, but I don't know. She was last seen wearing uh, black leggings, black sweater, and black Ugg boots. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Lancaster County. Right, so apparently she's been found, but they, the post, let me uh, go check the Facebook page really quick. Just a second. All right, so somebody said it's her sister. Okay, that's somebody else. Huh. Well, did they... Oh, so it says located. Okay, it says the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office has located Dana Benitez in Lincoln, Nebraska, and is no longer considering her a missing person. She was located at 5.50 p.m. on February 2nd. Um, let's see... Would like to thank all those who assisted. Somebody said she was in bad shape, though. Earlier, they said she was injured and whatnot. But I don't see that post now, so maybe they took that down. I don't know, it was kind of a weird story, because the guy driving didn't, didn't report her missing until, like, the next day. Uh, I mean, my God, if, if I, my car pulled, slid off the road and my wife or girlfriend was in the in the truck and then when I come back they're just gone I'd be you know making sure I was calling people the first day but we don't really know the circumstances at this point but I just thought I'd bring that up because people were talking about it and that was the that's the extent of the information the story the case got resolved basically before we even <laughs> got to look at it Man, Chloe's running around like a bat out of hell. I don't know if you guys can hear it, see that, but my God. Let me see if I can. I'm looking for that camera. Uh, he looks like he quit running. see it can you guys hear it hear them Chloe <laughs> maybe there it is it's hard it's all messed up but You always catch it a little too late. I mean, she was just sprinting back and forth. Okay. Well, now we're going to cover this case of the the three children that case though uh, they were killed in Chicago in 1955 and it looks like it's got a resolution later but it's it seems interesting enough to go over so at least for once we'll be able, and, and then we can also think is this guy possibly related to the Grimes sisters
All right. So it says three nude bodies found with heads split. Schoolboys, 11, 13, this is one that we were talking about yesterday. 13 and 14 disappear Sunday are discovered dead in a forest preserve road, roadway ditch. The nude bodies of the three boys, their heads bashed in, were found today in a Cook County forest preserve northwest of Chicago. It's not really quite like what there's, makes it sound like they're in the middle of the woods. Thanks, Kit Kat. Are you starting a, a wave for me? A $2, $2 taco wave? Yeah. Police of the Forest Ranger Service said the bodies are believed to be those of three Chicago boys who disappeared Sunday after leaving their homes to attend a movie. So just like the Grime Sisters, they went to a movie. Police said the bodies were found in a ditch alongside a road leading into Robinson Woods near Lawrence Avenue. Okay, now we know where that is. Let's see if I can find that. Hold on a second. All right, Caroline T got me five. Excellent. Five tacos. Two dollar taco Tuesday wave taco. Yeah, so I think it's this is the. Thank you, Lee D, Claudia Neubauer, and Tracy. Wow, you guys are getting me like double fisted um, tacos. <laughs> Chewbacca? Chewbacca? Oh, I'll be Chewbacca if you want me to. Tacos. Tacos. Thank you, Claudia, Tracy, One Sly Angel, Lee D, Carolina T. Oh, and there's Emily Flotilla with another one. You guys trying to fatten me up a little bit? Taco, taco, me a taco, you a taco, let's all have tacos. Emily Flotilla and Linda Howe, as in Linda Molden Howe of the Cattle Mutilations. <laughs> and Crop Circles. Salsa. I wonder if it was right there. Why does that seem... Robinson Woods. Where's that? Another taco. No, oh, that's it. <laughs> that's Robinson Woods. So I think it's going to be right in here. I don't know. I don't think that's changed. Following Kit Kat, Ocean Wave. Thank you, Linda Hal, Gene Fish. See, generous freaks. Thank you very much. Oh, and there's Marine Co. All right, I do have pictures. Okay, so if you don't want to see these pictures, because they're pretty clear, um, then don't watch, okay? But if you're somebody that feels like you can look at it, I mean, it's pretty crazy. Uh, but look, these are all these detectives and, you know, there's actually three kids there. There's a body there and then there's, you can't see tons of detail, but then there's a hand here 
of a third kid that's over like that. One kid's laying like that, and one kid's like that. Um, you know. Pretty crazy. Thanks, Marine Co. See, but when you look at the picture, when you zoom back out, let me... Uh, this looks like a, an actual parking place. It's not like it's in the middle of the woods somewhere. So that's what makes me think that it's just... Like, this probably hasn't changed much. I have a feeling it's just right in here. You know? Uh, let's see if we can kind of picture where this might be. I bet you it's right there. You know what? I think they're right in this. Right there. Thank Taco, you. <laughs> if you're going to have food, my donation should go to water, drink, adult beverage. Go. <laughs> That's right. You know, I'm actually thinking... Watch. Let me just show you this. See this right there? I wonder if that's this-ish, you know? I don't know how long these have been there. But then if you look, there's this little ditch right there. And I'm kind of wondering if that's what the ditch is. It's just newer, and there's more landscaping going on. Let's see. Let's see if we can identify this by... Yeah, I'd have to be able to get on the other side of that. Hold on. Yeah, like right here. I mean, it is 1955, but I'm wondering if it's kind of like the shot is being taken from right there. And... Yeah, and then out there you can see a car over there. Maybe that's where the road is, like over here. And it's different time of year. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, this is 1955. I don't think there's a ditch on the other side. So I think it is this ditch right here. And it was just not a groomed park at the time. You know, it was a little bit more uh, just overgrown. I have another picture. You know, this might help too, I guess, different angle. And in this one, you can see one of the faces. You know, so I think they've groomed the park over the years, and now there isn't really any you know like all this land is grass now back there but there's that ditch right there must be just crazy for these guys too right Yeah, I think that's the ditch. And they said it was leading to this Robeson Park here. Okay, let me get back to this. So now you've got sort of a feel-ish for the park. I'm sure it was a lot more overgrown in 1955. And you saw the crime scene. Police said the bodies were found in a ditch alongside a road leading into Robinson Woods. And this is Robinson Woods. That's a road leading into it. So I think that was it. You know, I guess it's also possible it maybe was... But I think we're in the right ditch. It could have been around here. We don't know. Let's see if there's any... If we can go back in time. Yeah, so even in 1999, it looked similar. 85 is really blurry. You can't see it. Wow, thank you. Man, I, I'm going to eat 25 tacos from Jamie McLaughlin. 
Thank you. I'm looking at the screen now, so hopefully the cat eye donation won't freak me out. And thank you, JK. So I, I don't know, I might get a drink. I love Tuesdays. Oh, thanks, Sandra, for the uh, PayPal. Hey, thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, Colleen sent me an email today, so I'll just update you on... All right, so here we go. She said she just submitted the case to Astria for a quote. Um, she expressed her concern about the extraction. You know, if we have to do another exhumation. Uh, and that the previous specimens, considering that the UNT was unable to extract any DNA from the, the items that they had already got from an exhumation. And she said, you know, she's just in communication and she's letting me know. There might be an extra cost here, but you guys don't have to worry about that. I'll be taking care of it. Uh, let's see, I don't think we would have. Yeah, so basically it says, I just submitted the case to Astria for a quote. I express our concerns about doing another extraction on the previous specimens considering that UNT was unable to extract any DNA from them in two tries. One of the samples including several teeth and the other included part of a left tibia. So they weren't able to get DNA from those, which is kind of surprising because those are usually teeth that are pretty good. But man, maybe he's got hair in there, right? You could do, wasn't that, isn't that mitochondria DNA? What in the hell is this Jeff Buzz person talking about? <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> what an idiot. You know, I, I, I never said anything like that. Hey, uh, hey, Jeff Buzz, go do your own thing, you idiot, okay? Nobody said anything like what you just said. You took it all out of context. I, don't, I have never said anything bad about Madeline McCann. Okay, I just said there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. And yeah, maybe I said, I don't even know which one you're talking about. Which video, we've talked about her a thousand times. All right, clown? All right. But let me be the one to hide somebody, okay? So. You know, you always have these people that show up and think that you give a damn what they're saying like oh they're oh wow yes you heard a two second snippet and assigned it to everything so therefore I'm supposed to just go wow you're right you're right Jeff Buzz you're so interesting <laughs> uh, what, a, what a loser Jesus and he just called us all American scum Hey, what happened? What's going on, Blue? What's going on, Blue? Blue, what's going on? I think you should look in the mirror there, Jeff Buzz. You'll probably find the scum that you were talking about. And I, I wasn't referring to your looks, just your soul as a person. Yeah, his other, his, well, I'll read what he said just so, you know, everybody might have missed it. He says, I just saw your treatment of the Madeline McCann situation. I heard Sasquatch and Bigfoot and the word cool in between. I've been following you for a bit, but you treat non-American crimes 
as don't matter. Well, why don't you learn to write better? That was a terrible sentence, first of all. Then the second one was, don't bother answering F you American scum. Okay? I never treated Metal McCann poorly. And I've covered many cases that aren't in the United States, and I cover them exactly the same way. Okay? Okay, don't remove it. It says, no, you may say what you wish, but you are what you are. No mirrors here. <laughs> hey, hey, Jeff Buzz, you're an idiot, though, okay? I didn't treat the case badly at all. I know exactly how I've, I've been in that case. Um, you're just one of those people that craves attention. You probably think you're an expert on the case, that you covered it. You've looked at it so well, and you know who the killer is. If you could just get to the right person. So when somebody didn't cover it the way you wanted to, you attack them on the show after maybe hearing one comment out of context, okay? Because I would never do that. You're an idiot, all right? And that's a fact. I mean, you uh, technically, like literally, if you looked it up, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that was fun. Hey, see you later. Go do a, go uh, do something else. All right, not not here though. And thanks for having the respect for the case that we're covering, Jeff. Okay, because what you just did was way worse than anything like that. At least I was covering the case, and you just misinterpreted it. But what you did just now is you came in and interrupted a new case that we're talking about that deserved all the respect in the world, but you trashed it like the piece of trash that you are, okay? So go do what you do, all right? Jesus, what a clown. All right, here we go. So the missing youngsters are Robert M. Peterson, 14, John Schusler, 13, and where were we at? We were right here. The bodies are believed to be those. I think we were at the... Hold on. Yeah, this is the right one. I'm trying to find where it mentioned. Oh, yeah. Alongside a road leading into Robinson Wood. The missing youngsters are Robert M. Peterson, 14, John Sluicer, 13, and his brother, Anton, 11. The bodies were found near Schiller Park, several miles from the boys' homes. Uh, when they left home Sunday, the boys told their parents they were going to downtown Chicago to see a motion picture. The Peterson boys and John uh, Schusler were in the eighth grade at Farragut Public School and Anton Schusler was a sixth grader in the same school. They left home Sunday afternoon, but two friends reported seeing them Sunday night. The friends, a boy and a girl, told Miss Eleanor Schusler's mother of the brothers they saw the three lads Sunday night in a bowling alley on the northwest side. The boys told of having been to the downtown movie before going to the bowling alley. So they went to a, bowl, a movie, then a bowling alley. Don Goodman, owner of a riding stable in the area. Well, that's interesting. A riding stable in the area reported to police he was in a saloon when a man rushed in excited and breathless and told of the bodies being discovered. Deputy Sheriff Russell J. Riley said the boys' skulls had been hit with such violence that they were split open. <laughs> yeah. I'm just reading some comments. Yeah, l listen, I tell you what, if I was ever laughing in a case at a victim like that, you guys would let me know and I wouldn't be able to get away with it. I, I, I wouldn't even do that, actually. Uh, I would never do it. But if I did, you guys would be like, gosh, Gray, that was disappointing or something. I would have heard about it. It just didn't happen, you know. So this guy, it does, you know, I might have brought up Sasquatch or something 
comparing what here, here's what the reality was you want to hear it i was making fun of probably the crazy theories out there and then said something about sasquatch you know maybe it's sasquatch or something you know because there's all these crazy theories in that case but he believes in one of those crazy theories and he felt disrespected and therefore had to lash out in anguish and pain. <laughs> like, like he was old, you know, intimately involved. How much you want to bet that's what it was? You know, like, for example, the show that we covered last night, a person came on and said, hey, I've been covering this for six years. Uh, you know, what about this? What about this? And it's like, hey, okay, cool, man. I, I was just trying to let people be aware of it. I did see the articles mentioning four kids and all that, uh, different things. Um, I also questioned what happened to the three puncture wounds in, in the chest of Barbara Grimes, or I think it was Barbara. Maybe it actually could have been Patricia, where there was, yeah, I think it was Patricia, actually, the three puncture wounds they never mentioned it again and they never mentioned sexual assault which is really obvious that that happened and then later at the very end they mentioned the sexual assault again and therefore you realize that the puncture wounds were real too they were just keeping that out of the media it just boom complete blackout on that after that so i think they even knew that they didn't die from exposure there's no no way Yeah, well, thanks, Shelly, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, every once in a while, I might, you know, people make mis We're not robots, right? We make mistakes. But I think you guys would notice something like that and tell me. I mean, we, everybody here communicates pretty well. We get, I get emails from people if something bothers them or, you know, I'm sure somebody would have said something. All right, I'm going to start right here. At about 8 p.m., they were seen in another bowling alley at 35... Let me see. Hmm. I'm missing... God, how come that's... I'm missing that again. Okay, seen at the bowling alley. They next were seen between 7.15 and 7.45 p.m. Sunday in a bowling alley at... I'm going to have to open up newspapers.com really quick all right so this is going to be Illinois and this I got the date up here oops October 19th 1955 so This one. And those, those are the three boys right there. Man, it's hard to uh, figure out which story there that it went. <laughs> There's so many of them. Uh, let's see. Neither Schiller nor his wife, 37, have slept. The boys were all we had. You know what? You know what's really sad is the father. He killed himself. Just that's all they had. Look what he said. That's all we had. Those are their only two kids. And they he he actually killed himself. Not too long after this. The boys were all we had. All we lived for. Miss Schusler said. We bought this house for them. Man. 
Okay, I think it's right here. The three boys left the Peterson home at 3.30 p.m. After telephoning a loop, telephoning a loop movie where a Walt Disney picture was playing to verify the price of admission. They had about $4 among them. They next were seen between 7.15 and 7.45, so they called to see about how much the movie would cost. But then they were seen at 7.15 and 7.45 p.m. Sunday in a bowling alley at, let's see, 3-3, Montrose Avenue. So apparently that almost looks like it could still be a bowling alley. This is, uh, okay. Bowling Alley 1. Oops. All right, let's go down to Street View here. It's amazing how similar neighborhoods look they haven't changed so now it looks like it's a market now but you can definitely see that a, a bowling alley might have perhaps fit in there I don't know maybe it's totally different now but anyways that was a bowling alley at one point looks like a really old building though and that was between let's put that in there 7.15 to 7.45. Here they talked with an acquaintance, Ernest Nuidamaski. Man, what a, look at that name. N-I-E-W-I-A-D-O-M. So Domsky... Niewadomski, maybe. 17 of 5730 North Major Avenue, a pupil in Gordon Technical High School who had gone to the bowling alley with his two sisters, Leona, 20, and Delphine, 10. He told police that the three boys told him of having attended a movie and that they had traveled to the bowling alley by bus and subway afterwards. He said he asked them if they wanted to bowl and that one of them replied, no, unless you pay for it. The Peterson boy and Anton Schusler went to the washroom and remained there about five minutes, he said. When they emerged, they rejoined John Schusler, said, let's go, John, and all left. So they all left that bowling alley. Now they're at the second bowling alley. About 8 p.m., they were seen in another bowling alley at 3550, same street. So it's really not far away, it's just down the street. So they went down to this building. That look that doesn't look like a bowling alley anymore, but it was there. Bowling alley two. Okay, and they remained here only about five minutes. So they got there at about eight. All right, so let me put eight PM. Yep, yeah, so seven fifteen, seven forty five here. Walked down here, got there at 8, then maybe left at 8.05. George Godfrey Dillon and 
a caretaker of the bowling alley at 3326, the other one, who also lives there, identified pictures of the three boys and said he saw them in the bowling alley not only between 7.15 and 3.45, but also at 3.30 p.m. Sunday afternoon, the hour at which they left the Peterson home. He was taken to the detective bureau where he passed a lie detector test. Hmm. Edward Davis, 62, manager of the bowling alley at 3326 Montrose, remembered seeing the three boys there Sunday night, but he placed the time from memory at about 7 to 7.15. That's close. Uh, Waldorf Lundgren, 61, of 1752 Columbia Avenue, manager of the bowling alley at 3550, the second one, said the boys came in there about 8 p.m. and wanted to bowl, but left when they found a bowling league occupying all the lanes. Robert Peterson was in the habit of accompanying his father, a bowling enthusiast, to a bowling alley at least two times a week. The bodies were discovered in the Forest Preserve Ditch by Victor Livingston, 50, of 2600 Rascar Avenue, a liquor salesman who said he drove into the parking lot to eat his lunch which he carries with him. The bodies were about 300 feet from the lot entrance. Let's see that. Are you guys finding this a little bit interesting? Or? I know I'm pausing the map stuff out, but, you know, that's what we do. We do that. All right, so let's see how close that is. What's 300 feet? This is the entrance. I'm sure that's probably similar. And that's 300 feet right there. That's exactly, look, look how crazy that is. See, that's 300 feet. And I think that's almost exactly where we had it a minute ago. Just very close anyways, like right there. And if you were gonna go down to the, the ground, and then there's that little thing that I mentioned, and then they were right in the, right, right about in here actually, because that, part that jetted out was uh, farther away in the background. All right, so pretty close, pretty close. From the lot entrance in a ditch on the east side, and yet the ditch on the east side, right in there. Of the black top area. Livingston drove to the Melrust Stables at 5500 River Road. So he drove, there was a bar right here. So that guy drove there. Telephone for, let's see, River Road and informed the owner, Don Goodman, who telephoned Forest Preserve Rangers. Milwaukee Avenue Sheriff, Police, Coroner McCarran, State Police and Chicago Police converged on the parking lot a short time later. Lieutenant John Lynch of Jefferson Park Station sent 20 policemen to look for missing clothing of the dead boys in buildings along Avondale Avenue, which have been vacated in preparation for construction for a new expressway. A cast was made of tire marks found in the parking lot near where the bodies were found and was sent to the police crime laboratory. 
Early today, police held one suspect in the case. He is Charles L. Dahlquist, 31 years old. Let's see. Meanwhile, police disclosed they were seeking and seeking as a suspect in the triple slaying a man who on Monday night took two teenage boys for a ride after meeting them in the bowling alley at 3239 North Clark Street. The boys John Golden 11 of 3016 Sheffield Avenue and William Muller 13 of 3008 Sheffield told police the man who they believe once worked at the bowling alley is 30 to 35 years old. The man drove the boys to the lakefront of Belmont Avenue where he uh, bared part of his body and had the boys whip him with his belt. Jesus. The boys said they repeated this act in an alley in the rear of 3200 block in North Halstead Street. And that sounds like a pretty decent suspect at the time, wouldn't it? From a bowling alley. The Peterson boy, when he left home, was wearing a black jacket with a white socks emblem, dark trousers, and black shoes. John Schusler wore a black jacket with a Cubs emblem, blue jeans, and brown shoes. His brother, Anton Jr., wore a black jacket, blue jeans, and brown shoes. Uh, let's see. Peterson identified the bodies. Malcolm Peterson, 40, and his wife, Dorothy, 37, visited the morgue in the company with Peterson's cousin, Bert Peterson, 34, and they identified the bodies. I'm going to skip that one. All right. Grieving dad tells probe of hunt for son. Two grieving fathers huddled together yesterday on a wooden bench in the Cook County morgue called to an inquest to recount their last moments with their young son's victims of a crazed murderer or a gang of killers. One cried at and the other started, stared straight ahead as they told their story to coroner Walter McCarran. Malcolm Peterson, 40, of 5519, let me get that in there, that's where they live, 5519, Farragut Avenue. That's it's east of that park. This is where they were found, just right and then right in this area, that's the house right there. So I'm sure it's So that's the Peterson home. So he was in tears during part of his story, told how he and his oldest child, Robert 14, worked together Sunday morning in the family garage, then listened to a broadcast of a football game. About 3 o'clock, the boy left to go to a loop movie. Not, not sure what loop movie means. Did they used to just play movies on a loop? And you could just sort of step in whenever you wanted to? I don't, I don't know. Peterson, a carpenter, told how he and his wife, Dorothy, 37, became worried hours later when their boy did not come home. They called the police parent, uh, let's see, the police parents, uh, I don't know where that, oh wait, it's below here. The police at 10 p.m. and were told to come to the station at midnight if there was no news. Peterson then phoned Anton Schusler, 42, uh, now we've got that address, 5711 Mango.
Probably not there anymore. Mango Avenue. Yeah. So that's where it used to be. You know, I bet you there might have used to be a row of houses right there or something. I don't know. S-C-H-U-E. The father of his son's companion, John 13 and Anton Jr. We decided maybe they had spent all their money and were walking home, Peterson said. We drove down to Milwaukee Avenue and looked in all the hamburger places. We went to the Loop Theater. I guess that's just what it was called then, the Loop Theater. We went to the Loop Theater. It was closed. We looked everywhere. Then we went to Jefferson Park Police Station. The sergeant was very accommodating. He called three loop theaters for us. So I guess there's maybe an area called the loop. <laughs> I don't know. Or maybe that was a, a uh, you know, like uh, a company. What do you call it? Like Tiger Cinemas, you know. Uh, they're all the same franchise, I guess. I said Robert was great for bowling. Peterson broke into tears. We started calling bowling alleys. Schusler, on the verge of collapse, was called next. He appeared to have slept little for the three nights after his only children disappeared. Like Peterson, he wore a plaid shirt and sports jacket to the hearing. His testimony was given in a barely audible voice. McCarran questioned him only a few moments. Schusler, a tailor, told the coroner, I did not know they were going downtown my boys never left home without their parents this was the first time they did it and the next time I saw them they were dead Wow so neither of the wives showed up uh, Ernie Nuadomsky 17 of 5730 Major Avenue a high school senior and neighbor of the Schusler boys said he and his two sisters met the boys and Robert Peterson in the bowling alley at about 7.15. Yep. All right. So now two days later, assigned police for house-to-house -house search. You know, they were doing everything they could. More than 250 policemen will start out this morning on one of the most intensive searches ever made in Chicago crime investigation. Their objective will be to find the clothing, place of slang, and other clues to the murder of three boys who were killed Sunday night and whose naked bodies were thrown in the Robinson Woods Tuesday. Huh. So that's interesting. They were obviously kept somewhere and then just dumped there later. Because where they were found, they would have been found easily. Okay, it's a, the city center of Chicago. Thanks, Emily. So one of one of the three things that I said was right. <laughs> um, Captain Russell, where they were found, they easily would have been seen on Monday, right? I mean, they were just right there in that park in a ditch. And we're talking about, this is October, so it's not snowy season or anything. So they're just going to go around looking for, I don't need to read that whole thing. And this is at the funeral. Miss Anton Schusler is carried into St. Tarkis's Church at Chicago after collapsing a long Inside the casket of her sons, John 13 and Anton. So that's her right there. And this just some random guy that's not even her husband or anything. She just collapsed. And what a nightmare. You know? Sons slain husband dead. 
So this is, uh, now I'm just moving forward in time. I'm 1990, 1955, uh, November. I kind of skipped time. I'm sure there was a lot of investigation, but it led nowhere, okay? But this is the, let me go up here. Police officials uh, spurred, this is really hard to read, but spurred by the broken heart death of father of two slain boys, vowed Saturday not to rest until this city's brutal triple murder is solved. Uh, the spoke as, I, I think they meant to put, they spoke as coroner jury ruled that 42-year-old Anton Schusler, the father, who could find no peace after the death of his two boys and a pal died of a heart attack. Well, he didn't kill himself. I think I said he killed himself. He didn't kill himself. But he just was so stressed out that he just, he died, you know, naturally. Crazy, right? In a brief, subdued inquest Saturday, the jury said Schusler died of a coronary thrombosis in a suburban rest home. But the widow, uh, let's see, something, policemen and friends used uh, listed cause of death as a broken heart. They've killed the boys and now they've killed me, sobbed Mrs. Schusler, 37. They can come for me next. Remember they said that they were their whole lives? The bodies of John, 13, and Anton Schusler, Jr., 11, and Robert Peterson, 13, were found October 18th in an isolated forest preserve Despite an intensive manhunt, no solid clues to the slayers have been found. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, there, I'm sure there was years and years of uh, stories, but I looked it up online, and it turns out this guy right here, 39 years later, 1994, he was charged... And I think by reading through what his, the story around him will get all of the updated information. Okay. So suspect charged in slang that shook city 39 years ago. Kenneth Hansen was a 22 year old. But look at that horseman. Remember, remember that early, that very first article? That's why I went, huh, that's interesting. Because I hadn't put that together yet. I think it was in this one. Was it near the bottom? Yeah, look at this. Don Goodman, owner of a riding stable in the area, reported to police he was in a saloon when a man rushed in excited and breathless. So that's when the witness found him. They went to the saloon, and that's when the police were called. Thanks, Emily Flotilla. But maybe 1955, there was a lot of people that... Uh, you know, we're into horses, I, I don't know. But see, he's a horseman, right? Just find that, I thought that was a little bit weird. Thank you, Emily Flotilla. On a rainy October evening in 1955, a strong 22-year-old horseman picked up three boys hitchhiking on Chicago North Side. So after they were at the bowling alleys, they were hitchhiking on Chicago's North Side, drove them to a nearby stable, and murdered them, according to police. On Friday, police charged a gray-haired 61-year-old man for that crime, saying they had solved a horrifying mystery that has persisted for four decades. For all that time, authorities say horsemen and stable owner Kenneth Hansen has lived with an unimaginable secret. It was he who killed the boys. The three boys, Robert Peterson, 14, and brothers John and Anton Schusler, Jr., ages 13 and 11, were killed in a time when streets were considered a safe place for children to play and explore. Hansen was arrested in a time when nobody would dare think the streets were safe. Yeah, so he was arrested when streets aren't safe, but when they were killed, the streets were safe.
and police say he is partly responsible for that. On Friday, police said Hansen had picked up the boys as they hitchhiked home from a carefree day roaming the city, going to a movie and to two bowling alleys. He drove them to a stable, sexually abused them, then strangled them, and later dumped their bodies in a forest preserve ditch. Well, what about the, the head wounds that they had? Because remember, that was originally said that their heads were just bashed in. Thank you, Maria Mazzaroni. Or is it Mazzarone? Yeah, I know you, you can <laughs> you can type it in, but I need to, you know, is it Mazzarone or Mazzaroni? First one or second one? Mazzarone, Mazzaroni. Help us out, Maria. Oh, Mazzarone, okay. I think I like that one better. The other one sounds too much like macaroni, right? Wait, what the heck was that sound effect? Hold on. Hello? Hello? Wow. Testing. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Hey. I can hear like an echoey thing. Do you guys hear that? Hmm. I don't know what that would be. No idea. But I sound normal when I'm talking, right? Testing. Hello. Hello, hello. Testing, testing, testing. Testing. Hello, hello. <laughs> yeah. I like that one. All right. Uh, Hanson was arrested in time when nobody would dare think his streets were safe. On Friday, police said Hanson had picked up the boys as they hitchhiked home from a carefree day roaming the city, going to a movie in two bowling alleys. He drove them to a stable, sexually abused them, then strangled them, and later dumped their bodies in a forest preserve ditch. In 1955, the discovery... He didn't try to hide them. You know, that's interesting. And also, if you go back to the picture if you guys don't mind if you mind don't look I thought it was interesting how you know it looks like see how they're almost posed with their hand I mean what are the odds you throw a body out and then their hands are across their stomachs like that I think that's somebody putting them that way or they had rigor mortis and were stuck in that position when they were put there. Yeah, so he wanted to make sure people found them, at least. On Friday, police said Hanson then had picked... Okay. On, in 1955, the discovery of the three boys' bodies in a ditch had no precedent. There had been little warning that the world could be that way, despite a massive police investigation that including, included questioning of 43,000 people, <laughs> Jesus, including Hanson. So he was actually interviewed. No one was charged. Yeah, I mean, if he do 43,000, he was just one in a bucket. Hanson went on with his life. He married, and I'd love to see that interview when he was interviewed, what was said in, you know, did any, was anybody a little bit leery of him at the time? Or? Hansen went on with his life. He married and had two sons. 
whom he raised while operating a riding stable called Camelot near Tinley Park. On, let's see where Tinley Park is. I guess it's way down here. On Thursday, Chicago police and agents from the Federal Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms arrested Hansen at his home. The arrest was just another spectacular development arising from an investigation initiated five years ago. See, this is what's so weird as I was reading this. They actually arrested him and other people for something else. It was just totally unrelated. But um, it was another violent crime. Uh, the disappearance of Helen Horse He's Branch, the multimillionaire heiress to the... Uh, let's see, do I have the next one? 1994, yeah. To the Brack Candy Fortune. In July... Police charged former stable owner Richard Bailey, an acquaintance of Hansen's, with soliciting Branch, Branch's murder. So somebody was trying to, I think they were trying to hire him to kill this lady, this heir, right? Uh, so they also charged 23 people for various schemes to kill expensive horses to collect insurance payments. Just as they did in the Bailey case, authorities refused to reveal what hard evidence they have against Hansen. Sources said, however, that the evidence against Hansen came from people who somehow learned of the crime over the years. After 40 years go by, you don't solve a case by physical evidence, Cook County State's Attorney Jack O'Malley said at a press conference. Hansen was arrested Thursday on a warrant charging him with arson for a 1970 fire that destroyed a competitor's business, Forest View Stables at 5300 West 167th Street in what is now Tinley Park. The fire also killed 36 horses and would likely have killed more had police not run into the flaming building three times to rescue the animals. Wow. On Friday, the Cook County State Attorney's Office approved murder charges against Hansen for three counts of murder in the peterson Schusler case. If convicted, however, Hansen would not be eligible for the death penalty because Illinois had no provisions for it when the crimes were committed. Police believe that on October 16th, hey, that's my birthday, good times now, I'll always have to remember that now, exactly ten years before me, Hansen picked the boy up as they hitchhiked on Milwaukee Avenue, south of Lawrence Avenue. Let's see where that is. It's going to be near that bowling alley, I would think. All right, so this is... Goes down. I think that's it right here, right? Yeah, Milwaukee Avenue. And that's the bowling alley. So they said 167th. How about 100 and 167? Oh, God, man, just work. Oh, that wasn't it. Milwaukee Avenue, south of Lawrence Avenue. So Milwaukee and Lawrence. All right. So yeah, that makes sense because they're over here at this bowling alley, and they probably walked over here, and that's Lawrence. So south of there. Just somewhere around in here.
นะฮะ He lived nearby at the time in the 5,000 block of North Claremont Avenue. So let's see, 5,000 North Claremont. So not too far away. So right around in this area. Hansen then drove the boys to Idle Hour Stables at 8600 Higgins Road. So let's see where he took them. 8600 Higgins Higgins Road. So right around in this area. I mean, everything's totally different now. Wow. And look at look at their found right here. So the guy knew the area. I mean, he lives right there or worked there, anyways. He lived, you know, he worked um, at the stables, so he knew all the stables. He knew the area, everything. All right, 87 Higgins Road on the city's northwest side, where he either worked or frequented frequently visited. Once there, he tried to pay the boys to perform a sex act. Sources said. When they refused, he became violent and murdered the boys, according to the sources. After the boys' bodies were discovered, witnesses told police they saw a car pick up in three, let's see, a car pick up the three boys. One witness said she believed the car was a Packard and police soon had questioned 970 Packard owners. Sources said investigators have recently determined that Hansen owned a Chevrolet at the time. The Schusler boy's father, Anton Sr., died of a heart attack a month after the murders. Their mother, Eleanor, remarried to Valentine Bud Kajawa, whoever that is. On her dresser, she always kept a photograph of the boys and the bronze baby shoe of each. She died in 1986, so she lived 31 other more years, and was buried beside her boys in a River Grove cemetery. Her stepson, Gary Kajawa, a telephone repairman, said she was often reminded of the murders. Occasionally, investigators came to show her clothing that they believed might have belonged to the boys. If this was the person and they could prove it 100%, she would be really joyful, Kujawa said after hearing of Hansen's arrest. She still would like to know why he did it. She couldn't understand why anybody would want to do that to some young kids like that. Robert Peterson's parents still live in the Chicago area, but both could not be reached for comment. O'Malley said authorities were not alleging any involvement by horseman Silas Jane in the killing or the disposal of the bodies. At the time, Jane owned Idle Hour Stable. But sources said that before Hansen had disposed of the bodies, Jane learned of the killings on his property and was furious. Well, why didn't he come forward then? Investigators believe Jane then helped Hansen dump the bodies eh, in a forest preserve ditch. In May 1956, seven months after the murders, a fire at Idle Hour Stables tore through a barn. Oh boy. That was filled with hay and most likely the clothing. What are the odds of that? Oh, that's crazy. Here, I want to check something out. Man, that sucks. I mean...
idle hour stables. Let's see. So there's ads in the paper for it. Yeah, there's I think I think the clothing of the kids was in that barn. Probably hidden underneath hay bales. Wouldn't be surprised at all. Well, I was trying to see if I could find that fire in the paper, but I didn't see it. <clears throat> All right. The fire came just after authorities began discussing exhuming the bodies of the three boys to look for more evidence. And sources said investigators believe Hansen set the fire to destroy clues that might have remained there. There you go. A month after the fire, the bodies were exhumed and police found evidence of hay in the boys' lungs. Oh, boy. Man. In the 1960s, Hansen and his wife opened Camelot Stable. He operated that business until the 1980s when, he was, when it was sold. In 1971, Jane was charged with ordering the murder of his brother, George, a competitor in the horse business. Months later, Hansen was indicted in relation to the same killing and held on a $50,000 bond, but he was apparently never convicted and records on the outcome of the case could not be located. Jane was convicted of plotting the murder, served prison time, and died in 1987, I think. Hansen's son, Mark, said he believes the charges are a crock. I think police are just, I don't know, man. Just even this stuff is enough circumstantial where you just go, oh, man. I think police are just trying to clean up some old homicide. Yeah, really? I mean, 40 years later? I don't think so. They would, they would have pinned it on some local person. I mean, just uh, like a bum of some sort. Hello? <laughs> Hold on a second. Hello, hello. Testing, 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 testing. Testing, testing, testing. 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 Oh, that works. Oh, I know what it was. My speakers were on. Watch. Hello, hello, hello. Test. Now it works, right? Testing. Testing, testing one, two, three. Uh, Kenneth Hansen has beaten criminal charges before 1971. He was indicted for conspiracy in the death of George Jane, brother of infamous horseman Silas Jane. But after some two years of litigation, the charges against Hansen were dropped. Now Hansen faces far more serious charges, three counts of murder. At a bond hearing Saturday, Cook County Assistant State's Attorney Scott Cassidy outlined the evidence the government had against Hansen. Witnesses have told investigators that Hansen admitted killing three boys. Strong circumstantial evidence connects Hansen to the crime. And another witness say they were with Hansen when he picked up boys who were hitchhiking, lured them to the stables with promises of riding horses, then sexually abused them. A scenario similar to what investigators believe happened to the boys in 1955. I mean, this guy was a a serial um, child molester. I mean, just a and, a and a killer too. 
Some of those witnesses say they were victims themselves, then later accompanied Hansen when he picked up other boys. See, this is like a couple of these other stories that we... Or one story that we've talked about where one of the victims also became the lure for the, the predator. After the prosecutor outlined the evidence... Hans's attorney argued that the state's case was thin. There is no direct evidence. Minutes later, criminal court judge Gilbert Grossi denied bond for Hansen. When the state announced the arrest Friday, Cook County State Attorney Jack O'Malley all but acknowledged that links between Hansen and the killings would be indirect. After 40 years go by, you don't solve a case by physical evidence. See, there he is. Let's see. He never felt we were enough of a threat, said Bradley, for 17 years, an investigator for the National Hooved Animal Humane Society. We are an annoyance to him. And he, hold on, let me go back. I think there was a paragraph that I needed to read. What Saley, Bradley, and investigators for a humane organization... Uh, remembers most about Hansen is his cockiness. When Bradley would visit Hansen's stable near Tinley Park, named Sky High then, renamed Camelot, to follow up on reports of mistreated horses, Hansen didn't seem the least bit bothered. He never felt we were enough of a threat, said Bradley, for 17 years an investigator for the National Hooved Animal Humane Society. We were an annoyance to him, and he played with us. He knew we got uh, he knew we got a call. We had to check it out, and he had his way around it. He always won. For Donna Ewing, founder of the Humane Society, it was more than the condition of the horses that tainted Hanson. It was his choice of friends and associates, namely Silas Jane. Ewing remembers back to when Hansen knew, now wrinkled and balding, was a handsome writing instructor with a head of curly hair at Jane Idle Hour Stable on the northwest side. That stable where police say the attacks on the three boys took place, burned to the ground seven months after the murder in what investigators now believe was an arson fire set by Hansen to cover up evidence of the murder. Jane, who was convinced of plotting his brother's murder, was a man with a considerable reputation and Ewing likened Hansen to a henchman. It was always spoken of as the horse mafia. Hmm. Let me move on. I'm going to go to one of these further... This is 1994, the next day. Suspect in stable fire charged in 1955 murder. Authorities contend Hansen, then 22, took the boys to Idle Hour Stable where he sexually abused at least one of them and then strangled them. Yeah, so what was the part about like their heads were hit with an axe? I think you were accidentally hidden, Gene. <laughs> it's okay, Linda. I'm particularly pleased to be able to put closure on a case that at the time caused a lot of grief for the city. Uh, let me move forward here. Former stable hand denies to son. Okay, so this is him talking to his kid. A 61-year-old man charged with murdering three boys in 1955 told his son from jail that he didn't commit the crimes. Mark, well, of course he's going to tell his son that. Mark Hansen said he spoke to his father, Kenneth Hansen, by telephone Friday night and that his father denied having anything to do with the murders. Kenneth Hansen of... Well, of course then, he's innocent. Man, what are they doing? Let him go. Saturday, during Kenneth Hansen's bond hearing, Assistant Attorney Scott Cassidy said he could produce witnesses who heard the suspect admit to killing 
the three boys. Prosecutors also said they had strong circumstantial evidence linking the defendant to the crimes. But Mark Hansen, 34, of South Suburban Glenwood, said his father proclaimed his innocence. Oh, wow, that's awesome. There we go. Web of clues slowly. I, I, I like kind of going through this part of it now. It's nice to have one that they've caught somebody, right? It seems like we always have these brutal stories and uh, there's not, no answer. But at least this one looks like it was solved. Hold on a second. Yeah. So, web of clues slowly closed on Hansen. During a long and discursive telephone call with federal agent James. Delorto and informant dropped one especially tantalizing line. He knew who killed three Northwest Side boys in 1955. Even as the informant began to reel off his story on that November day in 1991, uh, Delorto, so that's actually four, four years, three years before he was arrested. An agent from the Federal Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms knew some of the turns the tale would take according to sources close to the investigation. Huh. Began to reel off his story. So he was an agent, this uh, Delorto individual. It was basically the same story Delorto had heard years before from a state investigator who, while working a different case in 1970, pieced together a likely scenario of how the three boys were killed. Even the name the informant gave Delorto was the name of the state investig uh, the name one of the state investigators had mentioned to him, Kenneth Hansen, a former stable hand for the late Silas Jane. Over the next two and a half years, ATF agents crisscrossed the country from California to Pennsylvania from Texas to Wisconsin, interviewing more than 300 people as they gathered evidence against Hansen. Last week, the long investigation bore fruit. Hansen, 61, was arrested outside his country club Hills home and later charged with three counts of murder. He is being held without bond in Cook County Jail. His son, Mark Hansen, said he spoke with his father after the arrest and that Kenneth Hansen denied any involvement. For almost four decades, a gray three-drawer steel file cabinet containing the yellowing case files and the 1955 murders of the three boys, Robert Peterson and brothers, Aunt, brothers John and Anton Schusler, bounced from one Chicago police station to another. The case seemed as unsolvable as it was shocking. Occasionally, those drawers were unlocked we would get a tip from time to time, sometimes three or four a year, said Commander Philip J. Klein. Through interviews with several federal and state sources, all of whom asked to be remain anonymous, the following account emerged of how investigators found what they believe is the key. Now this will be interesting. The key to the mysteries in those drawers. In 1970, David Ham, this is 15 years after the murder, then a detective with the old Illinois Bureau of Investigation, was assigned to investigate the murder of George J. Ham's boss, or excuse me, George Jane. And then Ham's boss pointed. Hansen to a large cardboard box that was filled with years of investigative reports about the prime suspect, George Jane's brother, Silas Jane. In that box were several, several reports about the P-51 
Peterson Schusler's murder. By the time Ham was finished reading the report, he was convinced that the boy had been murdered at Silas Jane's writing facility. Wow. Later that year, Kenneth Hansen was brought in for questioning about the George Jane killing. Hansen was eventually charged with hiring a crew of hitmen to kill Jane, but the case was never brought to trial. While questioning Hansen 24 years, 24 years ago about the George Jane killing, Ham also slipped in questions that pertain to the Peterson Schusler killings. He was, he was asking him about Peterson Schusler in a way that didn't even know uh, that he didn't even know just what it was that he was being asked about. One investigator said he came away from the he came away from not liking Kenny Hansen very much as a suspect. But Ham was never able to develop enough evidence to bring charges against Hansen. Over the years, Ham, who is now retired, mentioned his findings to Delorto, who was also helping piece together a solution to the 1977 disappearance of Helen Voorhees Brock, the multimillionaire heiress to the Brock Candy Company fortune. In July, authorities charged Richard Bailey, an acquaintance of Hansen, with soliciting Brock's murder. In November 1991, 21 years after Ham came to the conclusion that Hansen was a prime suspect in the boy's slang, Delorto was on the phone with the informant when the man re, uh, recounted a story that dovetailed with Ham's theory. The informant said he had worked for Hansen years before and had even lived at the stables. Indeed, the two had become close friends. During that friendship, the informant told Delorto, Hansen admitted on more than one occasion that he had killed three boys. At the time, Delorto, a veteran ATF supervisor that colleagues lightheartedly but perhaps accurately compared to the TV detective Columbo, lacked the manpower and the jurisdiction to reopen the case and pursue the tip. In the spring of 1992, however, Delorto was able to assign two special agents, John Rotuno and James J. Grady, to the case after receiving a briefing of what was known at the time of the two agents, let's see, at the time, the two agents flew out of the state to question the informant. The meeting at an undisclosed location lasted four days. Upon their return, they had a detailed account of what Hansen had allegedly told the informant. On their first day back, the agents ran basic computer checks to learn if Hansen was still in the area and found he was living on Cicero Avenue in Country Club Hills. Rotuno then began the painstaking work of corroborating the informant's statements. He began t uh, by trying to learn if the informant's recollection of the stables operating at the time were accurate. At public libraries he, in Skokie and Chicago, Rotuno used microfiche copies. We don't have to do that anymore. We could use newspapers.com and newspapers to reconstruct the world described by the informant. In the end, Rotuno, Rotuno corroborated more than 60 individual points in the informant's statement. The ATF agents then went to Chicago police, who had jurisdiction over the case. They explained to police what they had, and police opened their files to the agents and began working with them. Lieutenant John Farrell and Detective Lewis Rabbit of the Grand Central Violent Crimes Unit were assigned to work with the federal agents. Investigators learned that the time of the killing, Hansen lived nearby. In fact, his typical route from his home on North Claremont Avenue to Idle Hour Stable, where he worked, took him past Milwaukee Avenue, near the place where the boys were last seen hitchhiking. They also learned that Hansen moved from the city northwest side to the northwest suburbs in October 1955, immediately after the killing. He wouldn't go back to the northwest side for years, one investigator said. 
But investigators knew they still didn't have enough to charge Hansen. They believed that if Hansen told one person about the killings, he probably told others. They began looking for another man who, like the informant, had lived with Hansen and had become close with him. For more than a year, however, they couldn't find the man. Finally, they gathered evidence against their potential witness for a separate crime, enough evidence, in fact, to issue a warrant for his arrest. That warrant was circulated nationally, and just three weeks ago, police more than 1,500 miles away contacted investigators in Chicago to say they had arrested the man, the witness they couldn't find. ATF investigators immediately flew out to interview the witness and asked him if he knew Hansen. He gave it up in a minute, one investigator said. Importantly, that man's version of Hansen's confessions differed slightly from the first informant. They were similar but different enough to tell us that they didn't get together and make up the story, one investigator said. In the fall of 1993, Patrick Quinn and Scott Cassidy, two Cook County assistant state attorneys, were brought into the case. With the second witness willing to testify, prosecutors approved murder charges against Hansen last week. ATF investigators and Chicago police still hope to add to their case and are hoping more witnesses or even people who knew Hansen in the 1950s will come forward and call a hotline. Through their work, investigators now believe that even if Hansen killed the boys alone, others were there and helped in subsequently, you know, the subsequent cover-up. Silas Jane, the owner of the stable, who quickly learned of the killings and became furious that it had happened on his property, also helped in the cover-up, according to investigators. Investigators believe that two other men either witnessed the killings or participated in them. One is Kenneth Hansen's late brother, Curtis Leroy Hansen, an associate of slain South Suburban Rackets boss James Jimmy the Bomber Katara. Man, it sounds like they just weren't really good people at all here. Uh, let's see. All right, well, I'm going to move on to the next. Uh, aging witnesses are ready for trial. So they're getting ready for a trial. Court hears Brock murder for hire offer. So now this that other court hearing is going on. Now, hold on. Okay, so then this one says, Hansen admitted killing ex-lover, says. Gray-haired and grizzled by the Arizona sun, Herb Hollitz, the son of a Chicago police officer, took the witness stand Thursday to unburden himself of a horrifying secret he had carried for nearly 40 years. So let's see, Herb Hollitz, the son of a Chicago police officer, took the witness stand Thursday to unburden himself of a horrifying secret he had carried for nearly 40 years. Man, you didn't tell your dad? One week after the bodies of Robert Peterson, 14, and brother John Schusler, 13, and Anton, 11, were discovered in a forest preserve in 1955, Boy, those damn those tacos are starting to sound good again. Oh, and maybe a cup of coffee to wash it down. <laughs> oh yeah, let's see. What are you saying? Money can bring out the right. I don't know. <sighs> let's see. I told them I knew nothing about anything. All right, see. One week after the bodies of Robert Peterson, fourteen, and. Brothers John Schusler, 13, and Anton, 11, were discovered in a forest preserve in 1955, and while hundreds of law enforcement officials conducted a massive manhunt for their slayer, stable hand Kenneth Hansen bragged to him about committing the murders. But Hollitz, now 63, 
never told his father or anyone else. What an idiot. Jesus. Particularly police officers who questioned him during a routine canvas of all stables in the Chicago area. <laughs> hey, thanks, Emily Flotilla. I know. You know, here's the thing, everybody, is I hate uh, doing, uh, you know, having to mention those kind of things, but, uh, you know, we got our mission here. I might have to be spending a little extra money on this. Um, I really want to get the 1961 case solved, all right? Thank you, Nona617, the hitchhiker. I want to know. I think it'd be amazing. So thank you, Emily Flotilla and Nona617. Love you, too. I told him I knew nothing about anything, Hollitz recalled. He attributed silence to a dark secret of his own he did not want to reveal. He was involved in a homosexual relationship with Hanson. Oh, boy. I was kind of wondering that uh, when I saw that over here. With Hanson and giving up Hanson would have meant not only public embarrassment and shame, but the wrath, wrath of his police officer father. And so it was a shock to Hollitz in August 1994 when his Arizona home, on his Arizona home, or in it, I guess, he saw a television report of Hansen's arrest for the three murders. He had assumed Hansen had been caught years ago. Stunned, he telephoned one of his daughters, telling her of Hansen's confession without mentioning the circumstances. The daughter told his revelations to authorities here, and a few days later, they were on his doorsteps in Tucson. There, Hollitz revealed the knowledge of the slang he had carried throughout a marriage and divorce, raising six children and alcoholism after the death of his father in 1990. After two days of testimony in Hansen's trial in Cook County, criminal court Four of the state's 15 witnesses so far have testified that in the years since the boys' naked bodies were found in a forest preserve ditch on October 18th, Hansen admitted to the killings. Well, his loose lips sink ships, right? But the most ironic and perhaps tragic testimony of the four was that of Hollitz. As police officers walked the fields near the idle hour stables, at 8600 West Wiggins Road, where a young boy's screams had been heard on October 16th as law enforcement officials canvassed the, the neighborhood where the boys lived as authorities interviewed scores of people trying to retrace the boys' final hours, Hansen was asking Hollitz for a favor. So while they were looking for you know, try, you know, the police are investigating. Hansen asked Hollitz for a favor. Speaking hesitantly and softly, the result of throat cancer surgery, Hollitz said he had just turned 24 and had been involved in a consensual homosexual relationship with, with Hansen that had begun about three years earlier. On the night of the conversation after they had had sex, Hollitz recalled, he asked me for a favor. He was going to tell me something, and I had to promise not to say anything. He told me that he had just killed three boys. Well, everybody, he would have known who it was because it was in the paper, right? Asked by Assistant State Attorney Patrick Quinn how long after the boy's death the conversation had occurred, Hollis replied about a week, so that would have been in the paper. What did you say, Quinn asked. I said, why? And he said that somebody had told him to do it. What else did he tell you? Quinn asked. Not to tell anybody, Hollett said. He said that if I said anything, his brother would kill me. Did you believe him? And he said, I, I definitely, he definitely did. And his brother, right, was, ended up being a murderer. In his cross-examination, defense attorney Arthur O'Donnell attacked Hollett, suggesting that he saw the trial as an opportunity 
to exact revenge because he had been in love with the woman who had eventually married Hanson. But Hollis insisted he just put his conversation with Hanson out of my mind over the years until he saw the television report. Mr. Hollitz, with all due respect, O'Donnell said, if you put this out of your mind, that you forgot it, how in God's name can you expect us to believe it? Objection, Quinn declared. Sustain, said Judge Michael Tuman, who is presiding over the jury trial. Was he laughing, serious, or what? O'Donnell asked mockingly. He, uh, he sounded serious to me, the witness said. Unless further questioning by, uh, under further questioning by Quinn, Hollett said that until authorities told him earlier this year of Kurt Hansen's death, he believed the defendant's brother was still alive. Hansen's defense lawyer have attacked the prosecution's case as almost uh, bereft of physical evidence and built upon the uncorroborated statements of associates of Hansen with scarred past, such as Joseph Plemons, a former Chicago horseman who was convicted of a $100,000 fraud. Anyways, sounds like this guy is pretty screwed. So here's the last one. Yeah, he got 200 to 300 years in prison. Declaring that Kenneth Hansen, Hansen should not again enjoy freedom's heir, criminal court judge Michael Tooman on Friday ordered the horseman convicted of killing three boys in 1955 to a prison term of not less than 200 years and, and not more than 300. Well, God, he gave him an out. If he could just get frozen to death and somehow that technology works and he could... Kenneth Hansen escaped the hangman's noose as the electric chair Tuman declared is nothing that Hansen was not eligible for the death penalty. Remember, because it didn't exist. Though he has been beaten, he has beaten the executioner, what lies ahead may not be much better today, tomorrow, and in the twilight of his life. To the end, Hansen, 62, denied that he molested and strangled Robert Peterson, 14, John Sluicer, 13, and his brother, Anton, 11, on October 16, 1955, and dumped their naked bodies in a ditch in the Robison Woods Forest Preserve near East River Road. At Friday's sentencing hearings, prosecutors Scott Cassidy and Pat Quinn portrayed Hansen as a friend who organized hit squads to hunt down and kill wealthy horseman George Jane, in 1970, on behalf of Jane's brother, Silas. They presented testimony from several witnesses, one of whom said Hansen hired two men to torch a competitor's stable in 1970, and another described how Hansen got him drunk and raped him in 1975. Latrice Blaine, the only living relative of Schusler family, wiped tears as Cassidy made an emotional plea that Hansen be put behind bars inside the same cage he has built with his own uh, hate and lust. Referring to testimony and Hansen's own statement that in the years after the murders he had molested as many a, as a thousand boys, Cassidy said. He, look, that's crazy. His own statements by Hansen, so he admitted it that he had molested as many as a thousand boys. He has, as you know, destroyed many other people's lives. The impact felt by these acts alone will never be known. How do you measure the pain a young boy goes through after he's encountered Ken Hansen in his predatory role? He pointed to Hansen, who sat expressionless at the defense table, Instead of the defendant, he cloaks himself in the body of a human being, offering little boys the opportunity to ride horses and then molest them, brutalizes them, destroys them, and sometimes murders them. I did not commit these crimes, Hansen insisted in a brief statement to Tuman before the sentence was imposed. If anybody is a victim, it's me. Ah, oh, poor Hansen. 
The character assassination has been conducted at the highest magnitude. After a renewed investigation of the case by the Federal Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms, Hansen was convicted of the murders by a jury of thir- uh, I mean, a jury on September 13th. Grief and suffering, of course, are the vestiges of all murders, Tuman said. But the totality of this case, from its inception even down to today, the effect of these murders transcended the immediate families. Hansen escaped the death penalty because the law allows a defendant to choose to be sentenced under the existing law of any year from the time of the crime to the date of sentencing. He chose to be sentenced under 1973 law when there was no death penalty. God, that's strange. Had these horrendous crimes been discovered earlier, there is little doubt as to his fate. This man should never again join free people in society. The judge said, adding that the length... See, the judge, everyone seemed really convinced. So this isn't, this doesn't seem, you know, I don't think you could have 15 different people uh, just sort of randomly making up a story that, you know, he killed the three kids. And also he burned the bar, you know, the whole barn being burnt down, just everything. Seems like it was a very, very strong circumstantial case. But he didn't get the death penalty. This man should never again join free people in society, the judge said, adding that the length of the sentence should be a message to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board, which will hear any parole request from Hansen. He will be eligible to seek parole after nine years. Ah, really? Jeez. Okay, but anyways, I, I did find this. Killer of three boys in 1955 dies. Kenneth Hansen, a former horseman, serving a... Why don't you just call him a foreign uh, barbarian, you know? Serving a 200-year sentence for the 1955 slaying (coughs) of three boys, a crime often blamed for ending a more innocent era in Chicago, died in prison on Wednesday. Hansen was 74, was first found guilty in 1955 of the murders of John Schuessler, 13, his brother. Uh, His case uh, was on appeal again when he died of natural causes. A source familiar with the case said that Hansen was suffering from dementia when he died. Word of Hansen's death evoked both relief and rage from a stepbrother of the Schuessler's brother. Tremendous, said Gary Kajawa, 61. I hope he, uh, it was cancer. And I hope it was the most miserable thing for him to die from. Let's see. His 1995 conviction was overturned in 2000 after the Illinois Appellate Court determined that the jury should have heard evidence that Hansen molested other, should not have heard that he had molested other boys after the killings. Hansen was convicted again in 2002 after a retrial. That's interesting. Hansen's death reopened old wounds for law enforcement officials who spent decades investigating the killings. I think he died too soon. He should have lingered, said John Rotunna, an ATF special agent who with His partner, James Grady, helped put together the case that led to Hansen's conviction. I know one thing, he's not with the boys. I just can't talk about those kids anymore. Yeah. Anyways, just crazy, huh? So that was the one... I I don't think he's the same killer of the Grimes kids. I thought maybe yesterday, but this guy is a... A child molester who um, molests male victims and even had a gay relationship. And I don't think he killed the Grimes sisters, even though they, it was a similar situation. Yeah, Jim, that's basically what I just said. <laughs> yeah.
just people understand you know you don't need to always type stuff in like that um, yeah so I don't think it was the same killer Do I have anything else here? Yeah, this is the article that had the picture of them. I think this is the guy that died. Look at him. He, he can't even deal with it. What a nightmare. It's amazing how clear that is. Look how clear that picture is. No, nah, I don't think it was a copycat. I just think it was somebody else that killed two girls. Because nobody even knew how it all went down back then. Hanson escaped the death penalty. Okay, uh, what else we got here? Yeah. Well, I think that's it, you guys. Maybe I'll make this a little shorter night than normal. Two hours and 15 minutes. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't know what the hell was going on. Because remember how they even said at the beginning in 1955 that they... Uh, They'd never seen anything like this. But maybe they just really weren't looking. Just because there was three kids killed, there had already been, you know, I'm sure many, many boys had been killed over the years and they weren't solved by other serial killers. It was just something that was too taboo to talk about. It's almost like they wanted these kind of cases to go away. By the way, do you see this, this face right here? Here's a forehead, a nose... Then the lips right there, and there's the chin. You see that? That's got to be a real face. Oh, wait, no, that's just a stream. Never mind. Yeah, maybe in Chicago. There really wasn't as many, anywhere near as many people living in the United States in 1955 either. I would say maybe a third uh, or less than. You know. And right now, you know that good old Gene's typing it in. No, Gray, I just had it in my head. Yeah, there was 165.9 million people in the United States in 1955. And right now, there's 350. So. You know, let's say, let's just pretend 10% of them were serial killers. There would have been 16.5 million. And let's say today, 10% are serial killers. There'd be 35 million. So even though the rate is might be similar, there's way more of them. That's what I always try to tell people. The whole rate game is lame when people try to use rate. Oh, yeah. You know, like if, for example, if, um, let's say there were 10 crimes in a city, and then the next year there were 20, and you say, oh, see? You go, look, there was a 100% increase in crime. And then in one city, there is, let's say, 200 murders. And the next year, there's 350. Well, that's 150 more murders, but it's not. It's only 75 percent increase. You know, so you, there's this math. Well, my city was safer. We only had 75 percent increase in murders. Yeah, but we had 150 more murders, and yours had 10. Where would you rather live? In the one that went from 10 to 20 or for, from 200 to 350? Yeah, let me know. 
Well, it depends, Gray. What's the population of the city? I mean, I would feel... Uh, yeah, see? There you go. Just like Carly said. I knew it. I knew that was coming. Yeah. Simple statistics, but people can't figure it out how to... Yeah. Yeah, what was it? Yeah, I think it was like, for example, just as a political thing, it'd be like, uh, I think when we were doing the, after 9-11, our debt went from like four to 10 trillion, right? So four to 10 trillion is a $6 trillion increase, but it's also a 150% increase. You get what I'm saying? So 4 to 10 is a 150% increase. And then Obama became president, and he went from 10 to 20 trillion. And he goes, well, I only increased it 100%. You increased it 150, George Bush. Yeah, but George Bush increased it 6 trillion, and you increased it 10 trillion. You see how the math there is really... Like, it, everyone tries to find a way to spin it around to make themselves look better. But it's all crappy. I, I think what we should do, though, is tell China, hey, we're not, we don't owe you anything. You know, right now, because of what they did, killing 450,000 people, just say, yeah, I know we owe you this debt, but we're going to, we're going to, I'll tell you what, we'll call it even. We're going to wipe all out our debt and we'll move on from there. Thank you. Yep, so mean. All right, everybody. I think I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to uh, chill out the rest of the evening. But uh, did you guys find that story interesting? I thought it was. I thought it was... It, I felt like I was there again. You know, we saw all the different locations, even the crime scene, figured out where in the park even, had that figured out before it even showed up in the paper, or before we read it anyways. Right here in this park, in this little tiny... The, amazingly, that little ditch that they were found in is still there. Right here, this little ditch right there. And then we got to actually see the conclusion. So that was one that had a conclusion to it. There's nothing to solve anymore, but I thought it was interesting. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. And, you know, make sure that you wash your hands, maintain your social distancing, and wear a mask. Yes, hit that subscribe button if you're out there and you didn't mind the channel. If you didn't like it, well, screw you, okay? Uh, I thought it was a pretty good show. <laughs> See, Gray? See, Gray, that's why people don't like you. Why couldn't you just say subscribe? <laughs> why do you care so much, Mary Lou? I don't. I just wanted to make a show of it. Ah, I see. Yeah, see? Yeah, it's just, uh, it's crazy, people out there. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara Smith. Yeah, I do have another uh, full folder of, of another case that led me to these other two. But uh, maybe I'll do that one some, somewhere down the road. Yep, definitely not a that, definitely not a suck up. Hey, can you please hey listen, please subscribe. I really listen. Please, I just I need more subscribers. Can you please uh, listen? I'll cover the Watts case over and over for you if 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 you want me to. Hey, listen, listen. 
Is there is there a case that I could, you know, I could just keep covering over and over and you'll come back, please. Please. Yeah, not going to happen. <laughs> See, I'm glad I was able to make you make you guys laugh. See, that's that's what that's what's all about, right? What's wrong, Lee D? You want to keep talking about the Chris Watts case? Yeah. Yeah, just make sure you hit the... And hit, well, even if you don't want to hit subscribe, please hit the like button. Please. But actually, if you guys would comment after the show, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody. Have yourself a, a good evening. If you like the channel, welcome. If not, go find another one. Thank you very much. And as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Reconnector, and I'm always gonna be a bug detector, full deflector, intercept. A vector on his back. Hey guys, you're there, can you hear me? Oh, just remember me do it again. I have no agenda. I'm not pretending. There we go. Yeah, I've been doing You can this still hear me rapping, right? Well now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector, a rejector, I'm a certified human lie detector, I'm gonna catch ya on a stretcher, you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector is my nectar, Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture, crime collector, free connector, and I'm always gonna be a pop detector, fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his specter with all respect, ya. Just remember, I've attempted for conjecture. I have no agenda, I'm a pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. Alright, everybody, talk to you. Hey, this is John Boy. Thank you, Zozo. Thank you, Zozo. Thank you, Emily Flotilla. Thank you, Maureen Co. Thank you, Swerbs. Thank you, Kit Kat. Thank you, Carolina T. Thank you, Lee D. Thank you, Claudia Dubauer. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, One Sly Angel. Thank you, Emily Flotilla. Thank you, Linda Howe. Isn't that what, like, Linda Molden Howe? Yes, it's like Linda Molden Howe of the cattle mutilations and crop circles. Oh, wow. Who the hell are you guys? Get back to doing your thing. Okay, Jesus. All right. Uh, Linda Howe. Gene Fish, Marine Co, Jay Case, Jamie McLaughlin, for the cat eye donation, Emily Flotilla, thank you, Maria Maserone, Emily Flotilla, thank you, thank you to Oda 617, and thank you, Sarah M.
bow bun, he's no sap, come on, rolls the bill and hang around Mars Diner. Up the China, cause I got a show there. I'm a bath book, cause I got a go there. Sass mare? I think Gray extended that out a little bit because there's still 160 people that are in the first one. Yeah, I think he did. I think he did. That rhymed with it. Oh. this rap writer how does this work okay so let's do this hey somebody let's pick a, a place pick a place uh, not Australia somewhere else now I'm gonna see what this comes up with okay Canada Canada Something you think about. Okay, crime. There you go. Uh, something somebody might explain about. Go ahead. Type it in. What's something somebody might explain about? Don't keep typing in names. I've already got one. So, uh, some, something somebody might complain about. They complain about murder? I'd hope so. A headache. Okay. Headache. Who are you talking to? People. Um, I was I put trolls. <laughs> oh, there you go, trolls. There you go. Six nouns. 
plant, cheese. Okay, give, give us some nouns, okay? Uh, knife, uh, hatchet. <laughs> uh, what else? Shoes, house, scissors. I just saw this just now. Uh, what else? Pillowcase. Is it one word? Pillowcase? I don't know. A plural noun. Let's see. What's a plural noun? Besides the one that Zozo said. What's, uh, what's a plural one? Oh, there you go. Ears. Okay, uh, six adjectives. Fast. Um. Stunning. That's that's too, you know. Okay, I'll, I'll put both of yours. See what it does with those. Stunning. Horrendous. I'm not putting bombastic in there. Hey, well, this isn't an attempt to let everybody know what your vocabulary is. Just throw out a an adjective. All right. You know, a regular one. That, Alright, there you go. Kid. What up? Yeah. Okay, two verbs. Yeah, let's put dirty instead of... Well, I'll leave it there. Let's see what it can come up with. Watch it charge money, and then I'll say, ah, oh, screw it. Watch it. If it charges me money, I'm not getting it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Yeah, yeah, hey, you trolls. It's time. It's time. Oh, God, I got to get this. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Holy shit. It actually did a wrap. I can't believe it. Oh, shit. Gotta keep that link, right? <laughs> I don't even know if this is a rat. Life, life is the fine. 
I think of crime When I'm in Canada state of mind I think of crime when I'm in I think of crime when I'm in the, When I'm in a Canada state of mind Hope the strife got some life My wife don't like no dirty fight Roll up <laughs> I'm rapping to the scissors, and I'm gonna move your powerhouse. Stunning, horrendous, shoot like a shoes. Boy, I tell you, I thought you were a news. <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> oh, I'm rapping to the powerhouse, and I'm gonna move to your scissors. I'm gonna move your, I'm rapping to the powerhouse, and I'm gonna move your scissors. Yeah, yeah, then Canada state of mind. I guess that's the, the chorus, right? <laughs> when I was young, my brother had abuse. I was kicked out with no truth. When I was young, my brother had, a, had an abuse. I was kicked out with no truth. With no shoes? You mean shoes? I never thought I'd see the news. Ain't a soul alive that could take my brother's refuse. They scary bed is quite the spread. Thinking of crime. Yeah. <laughs> this is... Hey, Trace Elements a lot better than these. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Flotilla? Thanks for being on my team! Gray is mean! No, I'm not mean! Yes, you are! Right, John Boy? Well, I don't think Gray. Well, he is kind of mean sometimes. Yeah, what are you talking about? See? We both agree that you're mean! Yeah, Gray, you're mean! <laughs> I'm still here. Just say good night. Okay, good night, everybody. Jeez, John Boy. What a maroon. Be safe out there. <laughs>